Since the 1800s, the notion that germs cause disease has become the dominant way of looking at our health reality. A single germ that causes a specific illness. Case solved. Germ equals disease. There was just the need to find the exact germ culprit that people believe caused the particular condition. Then all that was needed were medical interventions to protect you from that germ and therefore that disease. Those interventions were often the medically celebrated idea of vaccines. It became a simple medical equation. Germ equals disease equals vaccine. But there is a problem with this model of this single germ cause view of disease reality that can be seen in the historical data. For example, when we look at the United States mortality data for measles, the decline in deaths from measles fell by over 98% from the peak before vaccination programs began. The fall in deaths was even more dramatic in England at over 99%, almost 100% from the peak when their measles vaccination program began. The same phenomenon happened with whooping cough, also known as pertussis. In the United States, there was a fall in whooping cough deaths from the peak of over 92% before vaccination programs began. In England, there was again a more dramatic decline in deaths of over 99%, almost 100%, from the peak before their national whooping cough vaccination program began. Scarlet fever, historically a bigger killer than measles or whooping cough, fell to zero without any vaccination program. Flu pneumonia deaths fell by 90% before flu vaccination programs. And after 40 years of flu vaccination, the mortality rate is still the same as when flu vaccinations started. All of these diseases have a microbe that is the specific germ culprit that is 100% blamed for the particular illness. So then, why was there a massive decline in deaths before vaccination programs or even no vaccination program at all? Why don't we reassess our base belief in the medical equation of germ equals disease equals vaccine? So in all these cases, mortality rates drop before vaccines or with no vaccines, yet the germ theory remains cemented. Vitamin A deficiency alone, when corrected, made a massive difference in measles outcomes. In the 1920s, it was theorized that vitamin A could be used to fight disease. Dubbed the anti-infective vitamin, Dr. Clausen and Dr. McCord found that it was effective against a variety of infections. Dr. Ellison reported in 1932 that well-nourished children rarely died or had serious complications from measles. In the 1930s, scientists found that mortality dropped by 58% when children hospitalized with measles were given cod liver oil, which contains vitamin A and D and omega-3 fatty acids. Many studies in the medical literature show how correcting for vitamin A deficiency cuts measles deaths by as much as 60 to 90%. In 1953, Dr. Klenner also showed that vitamin C was effective against measles. He found that when used in large doses, there was a definite positive response manifested by increased white blood cell count, a drop in fever, and a general all-around improvement of the patient. For decades, we've been misrepresenting disease deaths because of an attachment to germ theory. People were really dying of poor health in the 1800s into the 1900s. Those deaths were almost always 100% being attributed to a single germ. Remember, deaths had fallen by nearly 100% before vaccination for measles, yet it was decided to 100% blame the measles deaths on a germ. Why weren't vitamin A and C deficiency considered? Why was the health of the person ignored? When you think about it, a single cause, single disease, and single cure idea is somewhat simplistic and an almost childish belief. It's easy to ignore everything else and focus on this simple-minded notion, but the data simply does not support the idea that a single germ alone causes a specific disease there were clearly many other more significant factors. Instead, what is paramount is considering the person's health. The often ignored terrain theory fits the data far better than the simple germ equals disease equals vaccine equation. Please watch the germ paradigm trap for more on the largely forgotten history of diseases and vaccines. The way the world changes is that people come along and suggest things which may be very uncomfortable for those who are in power. And, and when you're in power, you don't like to feel uncomfortable, so you do whatever you can to put that down. Now, from an academic's point of view, let's say a professor of archaeology, he or she, have invested their whole career in a particular model of the past. That model was already set when they went into the profession. 
right there, the very moment they start doing their first exams at university, a filter is being applied. If they are in any way outside the accepted teaching, if they are suggesting that things are not as they've been, as they are taught, then they will not pass those exams or they will not do well. In a way, in order to do well academically in that field, you have to buy into the existing model. Because if you don't buy into the existing model, your paper will be marked down and you will not get the results that could eventually lead you to becoming an academic. So by definition, academics are already people who've bought into the model and their careers are invested in that model. Despite clear-cut data showing massive declines in these various infectious diseases before vaccination programs, no one seemed to notice. All these drops in mortality were basically ignored. It was like they never happened. You might be thinking that surely if this was true, scientists would have written about this in their medical journals. But as Graham Hancock discussed in regards to archaeology, people who enter a career have a model of the past. And that model was set when they went into the profession. In the case of medicine, it is heavily invested in germ equals disease theory, and the solution for the disease caused by a single germ is vaccination. So if someone wants to be in that profession, be it a doctor, nurse, or other, they must accept this model. There is no choice. There is no debate. If you do not accept this theory, you are ridiculed, called names, harassed, or even thrown out of the profession. You can see this bias in medical journal writings. The authors select data that 100% promotes vaccination and, by extension, germ theory. Any data that shows death rate decline before vaccination is simply left out. Please watch Picking Data to Support Theory for more detailed information on how medical articles leave out data that doesn't fully support vaccination. And the idea that respiratory diseases, like the flu, are spread by coughing and sneezing is pretty well accepted as 100% true. Yet when you look at the experiments from 1918 to 1919, you find that no matter how hard researchers tried to infect healthy people, they couldn't. They tried with over 250 people and it didn't work. The healthy people who researchers purposely tried to get sick didn't get sick from an assumed highly contagious and often deadly 1918 flu virus. And since that time, more than 100 years ago, there doesn't appear to be any studies showing someone healthy getting sick from someone with any supposedly infectious influenza virus. So this is yet another massive hole in the germ equals disease equation. Please watch Unmasking the Proof of Flu Transmission for how scientists failed to transmit a supposedly highly infectious and deadly 1918 flu. Fast forward to the present, a time when germ theory has completely gone out of control, a time when a simple medical equation has had a massive, unprecedented, negative impact on the entire planet. Knowing this history of disease and vaccines and the enormous holes in germ theory doesn't make sense in the case of this current COVID-19 situation that there is a single germ causing a single disease. Like other past diseases, are there health issues that are a significant part of the problem? Vitamin D deficiency is widespread occurring in a massive number of people. This results in numerous health issues, including an increased risk of respiratory infections. Amazingly, supplementing with vitamin D was found to cut the risk in half. Acute respiratory infections are responsible for millions of emergency department visits in the United States every year. So a major health issue could easily be cut by 50% by getting more sunshine and a cheap vitamin D supplement. Early on in the declared COVID-19 pandemic, vitamin D levels were examined. Numerous articles showed vitamin D cutting deaths from COVID-19 in half or at least being of tremendous help. Imagine by 50% with vitamin D supplements alone. Low vitamin D levels make sense as we need sunlight to make vitamin D and for decades people have been increasingly staying indoors and out of the sun. So it only stands to reason because of our increasing disconnect from nature that most people are deficient in this vital nutrient. And by the way, sunlight doesn't actually provide you with vitamin D. It's the UVB, ultraviolet B rays, that trigger the synthesis of vitamin D. And you can't get adequate UVB exposure sitting indoors or in a car. Virtually all commercial and automobile glass blocks UVB rays. As a result, you will not increase your vitamin D levels by sitting in front of a sunny window. However, much of the UVA ultraviolet A radiation will penetrate the glass and may be harmful.
Another known factor in severe outcomes in respiratory infections and COVID-19 is obesity. We are in a massive global epidemic of obesity. Since the 1970s and really taking off in the 1980s, more and more Americans have become heavier and heavier. Today, 40% of American adults are obese and 7.7% .7 are morbidly obese. That's about 50% obese or worse. Only 30% of Americans are normal weight. Being a normal weight is now the exception. The global obesity epidemic and result in poor health are not a surprise. Since the 1960s and 1970s, people have become increasingly sedentary, eating copious amounts of junk food, and not exercising. Obesity is tied not only to heart disease, stroke, and diabetes and cancer, it is also linked to a higher frequency of upper and lower respiratory tract infections. As would be expected, obesity results in severe outcomes for COVID-19. The solution appears obvious, more exercise, eliminating junk food, and controlling weight. In other words, getting healthy. Something we often don't pay attention to is that pollution is estimated to kill 9 million people a year. Pollution contributes to a shocking 1 in 6 deaths on the planet. PM 2.5, or particulate matter measuring 2.5 microns in diameter or less, found in air pollution is a major source of adverse health effects, including heart disease. When people inhale polluted air, the microscopic polluting particles, PM 2.5, migrate from the lungs to the blood vessels and the blood, causing inflammation and severe oxidative stress, damaging our bodies. As mentioned, air pollution is responsible for 9 million deaths, so it's not surprising that, depending on how polluted the region you live in, it's a factor in COVID-19 deaths. A study in July 2021 showed the risk factors examining over half a million hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Again, we see the same predominantly lifestyle-related problems, high blood pressure, lipid metabolism disorders, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. All these essentially stem from lack of exercise, not being out in sunshine, resulting in low vitamin D levels, eating junk foods, and in general, modern sedentary living. And notice that one in five suffered from anxiety and fear-related disorders. It's no small wonder with the nonstop 24-7 media coverage emphasizing death, doom, and hopelessness. In addition, this public health media politician induced fear and anxiety along with obesity and diabetes were associated with increased deaths. Repeat, constant fear messaging by the media, so-called public health officials and politicians have killed people. They are responsible for an enormous amount of suffering and death. There are a lot of other health and environmentally related issues not covered here that impact us all. Widespread magnesium and other mineral deficiency because of our depleted soils. Toxins in our air, water, and ground. Plastic particles and their associated toxins we are all breathing, eating, and drinking. Medical error, the third leading cause of death year after year and more. And yet, they are all largely ignored in favor of the nonstop terror of a single germ. And despite all this available information, the medical hierarchy, politicians, and media ignore it all. Instead, they have a slavish dedication to the simple medical equation of germ equals disease equals vaccine. And where are the so-called public health officials and politicians demanding people correct their vitamin D deficiency? Any widespread testing for vitamin D? Where are the massive health programs to correct obesity? Where are the billboards, information on Facebook, notices all over the place to get people healthy, happy, and self-empowered? How about zero, nothing, zip, zilch? What a global, epic, absolute failure. Forget losing weight, forget exercise, forget friends and family, forget vitamin D levels, forget managing stress, forget eating a healthy diet, forget living a life, forget anything to make the people of the world healthy, hopeful, and empowered. Forget everything except one thing these groups are relentlessly push, germs, fear, death, and vaccines. Those in so-called public health, politicians, and the media should perhaps look at a new equation of what they have pushed onto the world. Thank you for watching. References and links are down below. If you thought this video was valuable, please like and share. If you find that you disagree with anything, please respectfully state your views. We all learn when we share and consider other people's views. Thank you and have a stellar day.